Good morning, Jags. This is Fahad. Today is uh, Wednesday, June 3rd. Good morning, gang. How's everyone doing? All right. Doing good. How are you, Fahad? Doing perfect. Okay. So I got a bunch of things to cover real quick. So I'm going to fly through a couple slides. Not much to add on the technical picture of the S&P. We continue to gradually grind higher. So why not just focus on the areas where I think we're going to make some money, right? That's what this is all about. So the first thing is, let's take a look at sports betting again. Um, we have more research to add to our already existing very big bull case that we have been highlighting. Now, uh, as you all know, I bought DraftKings when it was at around $26 per share two, three weeks ago. And I, two weeks ago, and I mentioned this in the chat room and webinars and Telegram and Twitter, every place else, that there's going to be a very, very bright future for DraftKings. And then later on, about a week later, we also recommended in webinar everybody buy GAN Limited, which is symbol G-A-N. We have some new updates. Uh, these come from Bank Amer America. Um, April was the best month for iGaming in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, which saw 54% and 115% revenue growth since February. Now consider this is happening at a time when there's no sports right? So no sports doesn't matter because there's a still a lot of international sports. And so people are downloading and they're betting on all these different games, whatever is available. Uh, so this is very, very good start for could potentially be a very strong, long journey ahead. New Jersey gaming revenues now equal 40% of the land-based casino gaming. Can you believe that? I mean, the iGaming revenues are 40% now the land-based casino gaming and 20% in Pennsylvania, despite being open for less than a year. And more importantly, the FanDuel and DraftKings app downloads are up 61% since 61% year over year since March 15. And that's why Penn National, uh, which is symbol P-E-N-N, -N, has shot up the way the stock has surged coming out from uh, coming out from March bottom. And here is another way of looking at it. Uh, 23 states um, have now legalized the sports betting with additional six states are considering legislation. 18 of the 23 states are live with 11 offering full-time and mobile sports wagering. About 20% of the U.S. population now has access to legal online sports betting or will have access by 2021. Um, and consider this, that this was less than 5% just until a couple months ago. So now 20% of the U.S. population will have access to that. And more importantly, this bottom highlighted line over here, the narrative for legalizing iGaming has shifted post-outbreak, with many industries and experts and participants noting that it could be a potential solution for ballooning state budget deficits and an all-weather solution for Texas. And these are the motives and the most important reasons why I believe that states will continue to move forward in this direction. Take a look at what's happening in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Just These are just remarkable growth numbers that are coming out for iGaming. Um, and I mean, look at how far we have come, really. And since the launch uh, for New Jersey, the launch happened in 2014. And for Pennsylvania, it was only in July 2019. And just 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 take a look at these charts. They're just phenomenal. Just continue to retire. And when you think about how big the addressable market size is, um, you will only realize that this is actually only just the beginning because the pie will continue to increase and more states charts will look exactly like these two charts. In terms of FanDuel and DraftKings, uh, this is what we are seeing in terms of app downloads. Uh, DraftKings has seen a huge surge, actually continues to be in a secular increase. DraftKings downloads are up 55% year to date. I was one of them that downloaded the DraftKings and opened the account just a couple of weeks ago and deposited, you know, uh, some money just to see when I'm ready when Michigan opened the uh, um, the gambling over here in the United States. And Michigan is supposed to vote on in the next couple of months as well. And FanDuel has has seen a huge surge as well. FanDuel is actually seeing even better than uh, than DraftKings. Now keep in mind that uh, FanGuin FanDuel has a huge partnership with GAN Limited, symbol G A N. That's one of the main reasons why we continue to like this stock. 
Um, this is stock, for those who do not know, just to quickly recap, before it did the IPO in the first week of May, there were multiple offers on the table where the company actually wanted to buy it, but they were, but the but the board did not want to sell it. Instead, they went to the IPO market. They did the IPO. It was a very hot stock. It was priced at $8. It opened around $10 and change. And on the very first day, it was trading near $15. Then it consolidated for a while and then it broke out again. And I still think there's more upside in these names. I don't think that uh, this thing is going to end anytime soon. And lastly, uh, this chart, uh, this is in big picture what you need to keep in mind about sports betting, total addressable market size. These numbers are in billions. And so for projected 2020, you can see we're at 2.1 billion. The year is almost half over, but for 2021, we're gonna see about 50% increase nationwide in sports betting uh, in 2021. And from that on, these are the projections that are on the screen. And I think these projections are still on the low end considering the amount of downloads and how when the sports come back. I mean, if you just consider how these uh, downloads are happening and how the wagering is taking place, even before we have any sports, NHL, NFL, uh, golf, all of those are still closed. They're going to gradually start to come online. They're going to gradually start to open up in June, July, and August months. And so I think these numbers are still on the low end. Well, you can see over the course of next five years, we are seeing a rapid, rapid increase in sports betting wagering um, in, the, in, the, in the United States, most, mostly driven by these two companies, uh, DraftKings, as well as the uh, GAN Limited that's going to be providing the technology behind it. There's also so, a lot of betting on eSports, um, like video yeah. games and stuff like that. It's, uh, they're, it's virtual, virtual betting on virtual uh, sports. That's uh, crazy. It's very exciting time. Now, I'm just hypothetically making a case over here, but imagine for a second that uh, Jay is sitting at home, you know, after putting kids to bed and he is watching and he's playing Call of Duty and he is winning. He's killing everybody. And he goes online and he creates this profile on DraftKings and he says, hey, bet on me, bet on me. I'm going to, and I'm here on betting on Jay. It's like, let's go. I mean, <laughs> So this is a sports betting and this is this is esports betting. All this kind of fun stuff could be coming in ways we have not even thought about. I'm just I just Yeah, and on top of that add the uh, pro sports when they come back like you said and uh, that'll that'll be an even uh, heavier bump up. Yeah, so you know, I understand DraftKings has run up so much. You know, we were we bought all of this around $25, $26 per share. All my clients bought it. Yesterday was a bearish engulfing candle, it fell. But that's gonna happen. You're gonna get, you know, after a run like this, you know, this is an early phase of growth, you're gonna get five, six, seven percent, or even ten percent single day pullbacks. But instead of being shaken out by by what's happening, you gotta take a long-term view. My question is, why couldn't this be one hundred dollars? stock you know in let's say two years from now uh, so when the market turns and you have a pure play and the biggest leader with consumer appeal with consumer appeal and state legislatures also supporting it then yes these stocks just continue to run and over over the time they become 100 200 300 500 percent gainers remember carvana when the same exact thing happened when the consumer appeal started and that stock went from 17 dollars per share all the way to 100 dollars per share and now everybody knows what carvana is that was another name that we made a killing on we were the first one to identify that mega trend when the stock was between 14 and 17 dollars per share and then Carvana had a huge run over the course of next two to three years. So I think that's something to keep in mind. I think there's more upside ahead in all of these names. Now, with that said, the second thing I want to quickly touch upon is, um, is I think that today could be the day when we see uh, growth to value rotation once again. It should be pronounced in certain sectors. You should see sparks today with green shoots in three particular sectors that are considered value or deep value, transportation, industrial, and financials, those three sectors. I think we're gonna see that rotation today. I bring this up because um, overnight, and if you go to the first read that, um, that uh, Chronicle just published, um, just published uh, not too long ago, last half hour ago for clients, um, in today's first read, Chronicle shed the light over here 
that uh, European markets are broadly higher again ahead of tomorrow's ECB decision. So the central bank is widely expected to expand quantitative easing. And based on market positioning, Bloomberg has pointed out that anything less than an increase in a stimulus could trigger a market shock. And so they're expecting to, you know, to announce something, some big bazookas coming out from ECB tomorrow. And ahead of that, what I noticed overnight session was a lot of bank stocks, banks and insurance companies in Europe were sharply higher. AXAA was up 6%. Some of the from the regional banks in Europe were up 5, 6, 7%. So it was a broad rally that was taking place. Now, with that said, here's the JP Morgan chart. And as some of you know, that in webinar, which is right over here, this was on May 28th last week, we recommended all clients buy JP Morgan Chase September 110 calls for $4.30 or less. I think this thing is going to break out. Uh, it pulled back, it ran up to 102, 103, then it pulled back for a couple of days. I think this is a setup for another breakout. And if you look at JP Morgan, in pre-market, it's already trading above $100 per share. It's trading at $100.60 after closing at $98 and change. So I think this thing is going to attack 102, 103, and then this thing is going to run. So keep an eye on banks. There could be other ones too. Bank of America could rally along with it, Goldman Sachs and such. So that's the financial side of things. Then the number two thing is going to be uh, Union Pacific, which brings us to the um, which brings us to the transportation side of things. And aside from Union Pacific, as you all know, we are already long call options in United Parcel Service. We recommended that as well in webinar. And Jaguar Media had a huge, beautiful bullish case that was also presented by Chronicle uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Had a nice breakout from the uh, the bull flag yesterday at 101. I think this thing is going to 105 plus. I bring up Union Pacific because Where's my folder? Um, I bring you in Pacific because yesterday at a conference, the uh, the chief financial officer of the company, Jennifer Haman, at the UBS Industrial and Transportation Conference said, feeling just a tad more optimistic about the volumes. And it does feel like things have maybe bottomed a little bit, according to the transcript. And then it goes on to say, but the last couple of weeks with the auto manufacturers opening back up i would say the trend is looking a little bit better and it's making everyone feel maybe just a little bit more confident that we are on the right path here these comments should send union pacific into another breakout territory i think some of this was already baked into the consensus view and i think the chart has reflected that with the with the rise so i expect that iyt in general transportation will provide a little bit boost to the upside um, and the last thing is industrial, just a quick touch on that. RTX is the one that we have been using as a play on this. RTX is guided higher um, this morning. It closes 63.40, is trading at $64 and change. So it's gonna open up. That's Raytheon, it's gonna open up a dollar higher. We are currently long call options, September 65 on this as well. So I expect we're gonna see upside in this stock as well. So industrial transportation and financials is what I am looking at um and that's it for me and by the way avo going back to airline because you've been keeping an eye on this one did you see the most recent uh, uh tsa checkpoint uh throughput oh i actually checked it yesterday but that was before the uh yesterday's the number came out yeah so we did see a little bit drop again june 2nd and i think that's mainly because you know all the protests that's going on but before that, we had another improving trend that we saw on Monday. Monday was at 353. I mean, these on a year-to-year -year basis, these numbers are still substanti substantially lower. They're 85% down. Protests may delay the recovery, but I just wanted to point out that it's important that you know once a week or once every couple of days, one could go to the TSA website and look up these uh, these trends, and that will give you the color whether some of these airlines that have sparked leap call buying recently, such as United Airlines, Southwest Airlines, and such, whether those bulls will continue to make money on those options because these stocks are gradually starting to recover just as TSA checkpoint throughput is starting to go up. All right. That's it from me. Um, Avo, what do you have? All right. Um, 
Oh, before I, I get into what I was looking at, uh, the ADP report just came out, and uh, yeah, it, there is uh, 2.7 million, I think, <coughs> um, claims. But uh, what I was seeing is that, well, what I see you don't see because you have the screen. In any case, that the forecast for were nine was for nine million claims, and today it was 2.7. So wait, wait, uh, that's wait. a Big We're not, this is not claims. Hold on a second. Um, if you're talking ADP, ADP, yeah, oh, yeah it's so, a change. Yeah, so we're talking private payroll. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be reflected in the NFP data that's going to come out on Friday. Uh, I'll take a look at this detail in more in more detail. But yeah, this is definitely better because um, right over here. The uh, the consensus was, was very very bad. It was looking for an 8.6 million increase in the in the unemployment for the month of May, and we came out at only 2.7 million. Um, and the prior month was also slightly revised lower. This is positive because that does reflect that the private payroll at least has bottomed. And you know what? This is actually uh, this is in uh, in in lockstep with what we saw with the continuing claims that came out last week on Thursday, where we saw initial claims are still being over two million, but the continuing claims actually dropped by more than three million, which was suggesting that what you know, net net people are actually getting off the uh collecting the unemployment checks which means that the job creation was potentially starting to happen again so this would imply this is still a very bad number in absolute terms 2.7 million but this would essentially imply that we're still going to get to about two point well, about 20 percent unemployment in the month of may in the nfp data that will come out on friday however maybe that is the worst and it won't get any worse from you know beyond that um, yeah, because question, we're looking at relative terms now, not uh, not year over year. We can't really compare that or any on it, anything prior to that anyway. Correct. Okay. So, <clears throat> what? Um, unless you had anything else to say, I can just go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, what I was looking at, and uh, you covered this uh, briefly in the Q and A period on May 26th uh, webinar uh, regarding chemicals. So yesterday, I noticed. Uh, after the close, I noticed that there was a bullish trader that rolled uh, calls in Dow Chemical, closed out uh, June 40 and went out and bought September 45. And the setup is pretty attractive, and I think this could move a little higher. And I checked this morning, uh, 4,500 September 45 calls are now in open interest. So I think this setup's pretty uh, sets up pretty well. And yeah, it's an upward move here. 3,000 of the July 40 calls were sold to close, and 4,400 of September 45 calls were bought to open for up to $2.05 offer. So they rolled up and they increased the position size in Dow Chemical um, in terms of number of contracts. So a highly levered play. And I agree. And you know what? If we're going to get that growth to value rotation today that I'm expecting and potentially for the rest of the week, um, then I think, yes, there's more upside in Dow Chemical. And technically, this has room to run up to 43 to 44 at minimum. That's another 7 8% to the upside before you start to see some stalling price action start to hit some heavy resistances. Okay, good stuff. We'll keep an eye on this. Uh, Jay, what do you have? So today, uh, just a quick update on Domino's Pizza. Uh, you know, you covered this in conversations on May 28th, so just last week, uh, and you discussed Q2 trends, and that coincided with their business update that they released. Um, and for those that do not know, the key takeaway there in the update was that uh, U.S. same-store sales accelerated to 20.9% from April 20th to May 17th, and that was an increase from 7.1% in the March 23rd to April 19th period. Um, so a wow. huge jump. Um, and, you know, they even said that the weekdays are continuing to outperform the weekends. Um, lunch is outperforming dinner. Um, now, Credit Suisse, and, and this is what I'm kind of getting at, Credit Suisse this morning, they raised their target to 415 from 400. Um, they had some investor meetings with management. And um, two takeaways there. Number one is they believe that 
you know, during this period of, of, of time where, where you've seen the acceleration, um, they've, they've acquired new customers into their piece of the pie loyalty program. Um, so, you know, that's going to, you know, add to a greater digital mix. Um, and, you know, that that's going to help same store sales going forward. But I think more importantly, the, uh, a catalyst to possibly keep an eye on is the company launching um, some, some new menu items later this summer. Um, Credit Suisse notes that this would be the first new product launch in over three years. Um, and, you know, we've seen what can happen. For example, Papa John's, you know, they introduced their papadillas and their garlic parm crust. Um, so just, you know, keep an eye on that. Um, but I mean, the, the trends are remain, you know, in acceleration. So, um, yeah, you know, I don't see anything it, slowing down. The, the number that stands out for me is that 22% uh, through uh, May 17, the comps growth rate, that's a sharp improvement over what was already a big improvement that the company posted last week, which was suggesting that there's that their second quarter to date comps were running about 14% growth rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the second quarter comps. And so it seems to me that these numbers continue to accelerate from 14% to now 22%. They're probably going to end up finishing the second quarter with comp growth rate somewhere in the high teens or maybe even over 20%. Mm -hmm. And uh, that just, uh, that's just great stuff. Uh, should be rewarded. The stock should go higher. You know, this is the kind of research that essentially one thing that you can be certain of that is that the downside will remain very limited in Domino's Pizza. And if you can, if you're going long and if you have, if you have confident, you know, that you have covered the downside risk, you know, then the upside will take care of itself. And that's just how it turns out. So 360 is the major support in Domino's Pizza. As long as the 360 support holds, you don't need to worry about it because you know growth is accelerating. This thing is going to eventually go higher and then the upside will take care of itself. Great stuff. Love it. Uh, Chronicle, you go next, buddy. Yeah, so I have a near-term uh, dash for trash idea, which is going to sound very counterintuitive. And it really comes down to uh, traders' risk tolerance. Uh, but this is regarding the recent outperformance of smaller caps. And one of the subcategories here that's not being talked about a lot is the outperformance of stocks with high short interest, which implies there's some short squeeze going on behind the scenes. Uh, so if we're nimble enough, I think there remain some good risk reward opportunities in using lunch money uh, to get to get long on some of these highly shorted names. Uh, no doubt a lot of these companies are terrible on paper, but sometimes we just have to tune out that part of our logic and say, you know what, let's buy trash using lunch money for a quick trade. Uh, what's and that what trade? I'm, I'm looking what I... at here is um, Nordstrom, believe it or not. Okay. Uh, this stock has more than 30% short as percentage of float. I think by now we're all pretty well versed as to why the market is shorting this company. So I'm not going to touch on those fundamental reasons. But what I will say is that all the challenges, uh, despite all the challenges facing the company right now, the stock just refuses to take another leg down. And similar to what you said yesterday, Fahad, about airlines adding liquidity, uh, Nordstrom had about 850 million of cash in hand going into this quarter with decent cash flows before 2020 and they have since added another 800 million via credit facilities so looking at their balance sheet there's no immediate threat of bankruptcy here and going forward i don't think it's going to take a lot for us to see the next round of short squeeze like we could just get a headline saying the ongoing riots have died down and i wouldn't be surprised if the stock just suddenly spikes 15 to 20 percent in a couple days and massively outperforms the S&P in the very near term. Technically, um, I really liked yesterday's price action and somewhat it has formed a base over the last couple months. So I wouldn't mind getting long here with a very tight stop around $16, initially targeting, targeting the recent highs around $22, which would represent 24% upside from current levels. I'm not playing for a breakout here even. So make no mistake, this is dash for trash, but 
there's practic and there's nothing practically nothing to like about this company but believe it or not this is where the alpha has been the past week or so so the idea here is to just get in take profits get out uh, because over the long term trash is still trash yeah, this is interesting stuff. Uh, you're going at the deep end of the pool to find something uh, that is uh, in the most distressed sector and one of the most distressed companies. But you know, you're right about the balance sheet liquidity there because that's what essentially has happened to some retailers that have been able to successfully uh, just raise substantial amount of cash in the past uh, couple months. And as a result, they have support there. Uh, even if the lockdown conditions uh, continue for quite some time. And that does give a, um, a, some confidence to investors um, that, you know, at least your downside for could be potentially one year or so could be, still be quite limited. Interesting stuff. And let's see, the only thing that I would advise on names like Nordstrom or even uh, Dillard's DDS or some of these other departmental stores is, you want to keep uh, looking out for some kind of uh, update from these companies that come randomly and they talk about whether stores are reopening or they're reclosing because of protest or whatnot. And those those kind of headlines can have whiplashing impact on some of these names because pres precisely because of the high short interest, uh, 10, 15, 20 percent moves is not is not a big deal for a lot of these retailers. So, OK, great stuff, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, Avo, I just saw your. Uh, your uh your the the picture that you just sent me so this is the seven day moving average of the total flights tracked by flight trader um and so we are seeing steady improvement and this is but global flights this is global flight so a lot of this is uh european i would imagine and asian that is uh that's part of this okay True. good stuff uh thank you very much see you in the chat room shortly